It is Friday, April 7th. Let's talk PlayStation. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another delicious episode of LTPS. We've got some juicy PlayStation stories to go over. So uh, first, as always, our PS Plus reminder, the April PS Plus Essential Games are now live on PSN. So go claim those, get that done. And also as just kind of a preliminary warning here, but if you just got a PS5 and you did not do this, but claim the PS Plus Collection Games, this benefit for PS5 owners is expiring next month. So we'll do another warning when we're like down to the wire on this one but just bear in mind that if you're in the market for a PS5 or just got one, claim those and get that done as well. But for our first story, let's cover up something that we uh, missed last week, or rather it came out right after last week's episode, which is Final Fantasy 16 going gold on PS5. The game is done well ahead of its June 22nd release date. So that is great news. <laughs> so if there were any doubts that this game was not going to come out on time, those fears should be quelled. Uh, and also appropriately, we learned of the release date for the Final Fantasy, uh, Final Fantasy Pixel Remasters on PS4 and Switch. That is coming April 19th, and also uh, those versions are getting some awesome benefits like the uh, pixel font finally, so proper font on that game, and then being able to swap between the original or the new OST, and then being able to multiply the gill, your XP, turning off random uh, random encounters. This should be an excellent way to play through Final Fantasy 1 through 6 now uh, on PS4, and also obviously PS5 with backwards compatibility. Moving on to more of our smaller news stories from this past week with the DualSense Edge. This controller now works on iOS devices running iOS 16.4, so just make sure your devices are updated and that should be working just fine. And then also for the PlayStation Store, Sony rolled out new accessibility tags for games that have accessibility options. So as of right now, this is only viewable directly on PS5 consoles, but when you're surfing the PS Store, if you run into a game that has accessibility options, you can see the prompt on the bottom. Uh, bottom right corner hit triangle that shows you all the accessibility options in that game broken down into six categories which would be visual audio subtitle and captions control gameplay and also online communication so good to see that that's a welcomed addition to the ps store and uh, very much in line with sony's constant improvement and support for accessibility features and options on ps5 now getting into Naughty Dog and their Last of Us Part 1 PC fiasco where they recently put out more patches which are very much kind of these kind of these short-term band-aid fixes they're not going to address the underlying issues with this PC version where it seems like or at least the running theory is that the engine they moved over uh, to PC is not really accommodating accommodating the PC platform all that well uh, and that is something where you know as much as we can kind of chalk all this stuff up to you know consoles are just basically PC PCs nowadays, uh, but consoles still very much have bespoke hardware features and thus also a bespoke development environment. So, uh, you know, examples for PS5 would be like the dedicated 3D processor or the, you know, the one pool of memory, right? So if we're just kind of moving the engine over without rethinking those things and how they made the game on PS5, like these can all be issues and um, perhaps that's where a lot of this is coming from. But we are seeing that Naughty Dog is openly admitting that this is not the Naughty dog quality that many people have expected so um they're addressing that and they're also saying that they're not concerned right now with getting steam deck verification they're still actively working on fixing the game on all pc configs and steam deck but they're not they're not going to chase the steam deck verification right now but it does seem like it's going to be a bit until the game is in a very good state the kind of state that it should have been on day one uh, so again it, that doesn't excuse anything but uh hopefully the lessons are learned here because it's not just naughty dog all PlayStation Studio devs are going to be have uh, are going to be dealing with PC versions for a lot of their games now. So um, you can have those PC growing pains for what are primarily console devs, but do that stuff behind the scenes, uh, then commercially launch the product when it is ready. So I still cannot believe they dropped the ball on this one. 
Moving on to God of War Ragnarok, the much requested and also very expected new game plus patch is finally here, but really there's also a lot more in that patch as well. So there is the new game plus mode, which will carry over all your equipment, weapons, and skills. Um, but in that second playthrough, you'll find that there's new equipment and increased level cap, new enchantments, and also some of the uh, post story boss fights are being tweaked as well to present a new fresh challenge. And then there's some new equipment in there that is the black bear armor that's the armor you see kratos wear in the intro of the game which looks so good there's also the spartan armor which removes all bonuses basically letting you nerf kratos for a more challenging playthrough and then there's the Ares and zeus armor from the 2018 game coming back as well and then there's also a new shield which has a very tight parry window but a huge payoff if you can um, successfully land that. And then finally, there's also a black and white mode that you can play the game in now, which is really weird. Didn't think that would be coming, but cool to have. Uh, you gotta love that post-launch update, which has a bunch of little free goodies in there that really make that second playthrough much more enjoyable, especially if you get all the collectibles and whatever else. You've, you've already done all the exploring, so you can uh, do a second playthrough and gold path it with all, these, uh, with all this fun stuff to play around with. So gotta love that, and now it's finally here for Ragnarok. Now, as for the Horizon Burning Shores DLC, we finally got some story details, or at least having a good idea of like who we're dealing with in this in this content, which you know takes place in a decayed Los Angeles, and that's where the Quen tribe has a settlement. So you encounter the Quen like in the back half of the base game. They're the one tribe that we don't really know a whole lot about, but it's something where they are kind of cool because they. They do use focuses and they base a lot of their ideologies on the old world knowledge and uh, teachings and whatever else. I'm not really describing it in the best way possible here, but <laughs> the Quen were pretty interesting as a new tribe in Forbidden West. So you're going to be seeing their settlement in the decayed Los Angeles. And uh, also you're going to have a new companion named Seika. So at least we have some some kind of idea as to uh how some story beats are going to play out uh, they really didn't say too much but at least we'll see more of the quen which i can uh get down with so between that and also the vertical uh, verticality that we talked about last week and also exploring the ocean more easily uh yeah i'm getting excited for this content more so than i do normally for dlc but uh i also really enjoyed forbidden west so maybe that's why Moving on to some more not-so-good PlayStation VR 2 news. Uh, granted, this is a rumor slash report or whatever else, but uh, this one does seem very believable. It's coming from the Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo, which if you're in the Apple news cycle, Ming-Chi Kuo comes up a lot uh, when it comes to Apple's product timelines and rumored devices, and so um, they follow that camp a lot, and they've been fairly reliable. But that, and they also follow many industries, and in, the, in this case where it's the AR, VR, head-mounted uh, head mounted display market, and also Apple's rumored uh, AR headset, this is something where that's why they're talking about this. So recently on their uh, Medium blog, they mentioned in a broader sense for all these headsets, uh, well, they mentioned for PSVR 2, Sony has cut their 2023 production plan by about 20%. They also mentioned lifetime shipments for the MetaQuest Pro is at about 300,000 units. The Pico, which is China's biggest VR AR headset, had shipments that were 40% lower than expected in 2022, and they're concluding that the AR VR head-mounted display market has a steep hill to climb when it, when it comes to becoming a leading product category, but Apple's rumored headset is the last hope here for investors looking for big returns on this space. So... Yeah, overall sentiment has been not really great. Uh, and that it's disappointing, right? Because I'm bullish on the experience. I love VR stuff. I think it's it, it just it, it's always so fun. Uh, whether it is these smaller static experiences that people write off, I, I still think those are always so fun when new exciting ones come up. Um, but whether it's that or these full-fledged games that are getting VR adaptations or you know things that are built from the ground up, but I love the VR experience. But there's no denying that at this point. It's a very niche market. These headsets are, you know, often costly. There's still the, um, <laughs> there's the, uh, the motion sickness and things like that. There's a lot of things getting in the way of VR really being, 
adopt it in a, in a big way. I think that was always the case, or, or rather we kind of picked up on that in recent years. Uh, but it will be really disappointing if, you know, say PSVR 2 in a year's time, we're seeing that it's not really matching the PSVR 1's rate of sale. And this is something where, again, like I mentioned, if PSVR 2 is doing bad, Sony is likely not going to tell us that, uh, which that, that would be the writing on the wall. So based on what they say during financial reports, uh, you know, if they have good numbers, they will shout it from the rooftops. If not, they will either not say anything or, you know, phrase it in a way where it's like there's been some unique challenges, but we're, you know, happy with the progress or we'll see when the time comes. But uh, still, for now, too early to call. But that report does seem believable that they would maybe have to cut their uh, production by, by a bit. Next up, we have another fun, kooky, weird PlayStation patent to go over. This one was highly publicized this past week, uh, and it's not a new patent. It does have a, a variation that goes back to 2020, but still something where a lot of sites were talking about this, and for good reason, because it's a very weird patent where it's based on a controller that would use uh, gel for the grips, uh, and that would be something where haptic feedback or some sort of other mechanism could kick in to generate a heat sensation or, you know, a cold sensation so when you're playing developers could use that for con contextual moments of you're walking through a desert and it gets hot you're walking through some snow and it gets cold and you can feel that on the controller now that does sound kind of wild and trippy and something that we could always chalk up to like oh that's a patent that they'll never use uh, just like all the other hundreds of patents that companies will file right it's, it's just something that they're doing because they're exploring it and thinking about it and, and they made something that kind of works and that's why they try to protect that technology. But the point I'm trying to get at here is that that doesn't seem too far-fetched when we look at how they approached PS5. You know, new consoles, yes, it's always a, a spec bump, but nowadays we're again in that diminishing returns area, but not even so much that. It's just that there's very few publishers that can really take uh, PS5's capabilities to its full advantage, right? So whether it's PS5, 6, 7, 8, doesn't really matter. That's always going to be an issue. So with PS5, we saw that they went for more sensory experiences on the DualSense, also the 3D, uh, the 3D audio. So it wouldn't surprise me if Sony's exploring these things in a big way for future PlayStation hardware. So maybe this would be something that's commercially viable by PS6. I don't know, That's it still sounds like a stretch, but I'm actually on board with this idea because I think the sensory experiences are fun and additive in a, in a really cool way. So. Just thought that was worth, uh, you know, speculating on. For our next news story, Giant Bomb's Jeff Grubb recently put up on Twitter his, uh, what he dubs, Summer Games Mess. Uh, he does this every year where he outlines the expected uh, live streams for the, you know, typical, like, E3 window. So he's always in the know on what publishers are up to. And so the news here is that for the expected PlayStation Showcase, he has them, uh, doing that before June 8th, the Summer Games Fest, which as a Jeff Keighley event, that's also something where we can normally expect Sony will have one or two things there. They always seem to give Jeff Keighley something, so that means we would probably have something for that event as well. But, um, and this goes back to what I said a long time ago, like it was always my understanding that the, uh, well, everyone at the time was expecting something in September, but you know that wasn't really going to happen because a lot of the uh, PS Studio developers were not going to be—they were not going to be ready in time. So it was always my understanding that they were aiming for the June, or rather the E3 time frame, which would be June. But the way that Jeff is, uh, you know, pointing this out, uh, something where it sounds like it's maybe that last week of May, or maybe the the later half of May. But if we want to try and speculate on when we should be expecting this, uh, this live stream that is probably what i would say that's again speculation but uh we do know that the company is ready to talk fairly soon because they have a lot of studios that are working on projects and this is where we should be hearing some big things um how big i, I don't know if we want to set the bar high on this one but it should be reasonably high given that we haven't heard a whole lot since the uh well the last jeff Keeley event where that kind of felt like a mini uh state of play almost now moving on to our big rumor from this past week a playstation handheld coming back 
but really it's like a, a remote play device. So this was a, an interesting timeline here, but basically how this played out was uh, it was Insider Gaming's Tom Henderson. He mentioned briefly during a live stream that there's a new there's new Sony hardware coming that is not the detachable disk drive system or the PS5 Pro. And then there was a thread on Reddit gaming leaks and rumors about the uh, ROG Ally and an Asus employee who had knowledge of a new Sony handheld, which Jeff Grubb then chimed in saying he's only heard about a cloud streaming handheld device, which I suspect all this is what made Tom just go ahead and publish the story on this which is that Sony is indeed planning to release a remote play dedicated device. So Tom says the handheld is codenamed Q-Lite and they clarify it's not a cloud streaming device, but one that is simply using remote, uh, remote play tethered to a PlayStation 5 console that the user would own beforehand. Um, meaning that it would be internet required, so it would have streaming up to 1080p 60 frames per second, and apparently it'll look a lot like a DualSense, but with an 8-inch LCD touchscreen using adaptive triggers, haptic feedback, and have the usual volume buttons, speakers, headphone jack, things like that. And also, apparently, it's scheduled to release before PS5 Pro, but after the September detachable disk drive PS5, and also, as an additional side, Tom seems more forward now with saying that PS5 Pro is indeed coming, but aiming for a, a holiday 2024 release. So let's just address the elephant in the room here right away. This is not a PS Vita 2, this is not a PSP 3, this is not any kind of dedicated PlayStation handheld because of course it's not. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I know there's like a lot of hopium on this topic, but I will never humor this as a possibility uh, because the problem with a dedicated handheld where it has its own, you know, its own dev environment, it, it needs its own library, its own software support, uh, it needs native ports. I mean, that's the problem is that that stuff is all, it's not commercially viable anymore for dedicated handheld platforms. That's why Sony got out of the business. That's why Nintendo went with a hybrid approach because they saw the 3DS did half the lifetime sales the DS did. That's why the Steam Deck, which has not moved millions of units, but the reason why it's an exciting device in the here and now is because you sign into it and a lot of your games work, right? It's feeding into and living off of an existing ecosystem and, and very easy, oftentimes retroactive developer support. So, you know, that's why that's why this is the way it is. Now, having said that, um, you know, I've always like speculated as an example, not to say it's commercially viable, but like the only way it would work is if Sony did like a portable PS4, because then it's an exciting prospect to sign into something and you've got all your PS Plus games on there, your PS4 purchases, developers can easily, you know, continue releasing stuff on it without having to specifically target it. Uh, but that's just an example. I'm not even saying a portable PS4 is commercially viable for some Something for Sony to pursue. But the point is, um, yeah, so seeing this, okay, makes sense. They're doing a lot of, you know, rem remote play stuff nowadays. If anything, I'm surprised that the report says it is more of a remote play focused device. So like, you're not going to be able to like sign into it and say, uh, subscribe to PS Plus Premium without being tethered to a PS5. You know what I mean? Like I'm surprised, but maybe that is going to be, maybe that will be an option. Obviously it's a rumor, so we're all speculating at this point, but um, uh, remote play does have its utility. I mean, I, a lot of people do use it in certain use cases. I did that one week long experiment where I only played via remote play and I'll always prefer native play, but you know, it, it does work. It works reasonably well uh, when you're in your same in your in the same house the same local area network uh even when i was like a street over at my friend's house i was at terrell's like that still worked really good actually uh and depending on the software it's really conducive to playing on a smaller form factor now triple a games not so much because of ui elements and things like that and the menu the menus aren't really made for those small screens but there are use cases for it, so perhaps this could be a relatively inexpensive, and I say relatively loosely here because, you know, it still sounds like this thing could be priced at like 200 something dollars, which I know sounds a bit crazy, but, you know, you've got a 8-inch screen on there, touch screen, the haptics, uh, has the PS5, uh, PS5 aesthetics, excuse me, um, I don't know, I, I could see this thing kind of being a, a weird, like, kind of high price, but it still would be relatively low. 
but either way, uh, yeah, not surprising, but um, I guess we'll uh, have to wait and see when they formally reveal this thing. I would assume uh, Tom is referring to this thing possibly launching, say, Q1, Q2 of next year, if it's coming after the September disk drive model, or maybe it comes out on time before the end of this year, not entirely sure, but he does also seem to double down on the PS5 Pro thing, which... Um, at this point would be a year slower timeline versus PS4 Pro, but uh, there's certainly, we know exactly what a PS5 Pro could be, especially since Sony has a lot of games nowadays and they're under their, their first party, which is doing a lot of unlocked frame rate modes. So we already know exactly what a PS5 Pro could do in that situation, but um, yeah, we'll have to uh, hold off for now before we talk more about these. Moving on to our latest update for the Microsoft acquisition of Activision, Blizzard, and King Digital Entertainment. So this is something where the CMA published the responses to their addendum to their provisional findings. So we've got Sony's response, Microsoft's response, and also there was an independent report about if cloud gaming should be considered a distinct market or not. But we'll look at both Sony and Microsoft's response now. For Microsoft, they actually didn't say much, only six pages, but unsurprisingly, they welcomed the news about console concerns not being a big deal anymore. Sony's document was 11 pages long, and you wanna take a guess at what they said. Yeah, they called the addendum, quote, surprising, unprecedented, and irrational. So the basis of what they're saying here is that the revised lifetime model of users is flawed the one that led to the addendum of not considering console competition a concern, and that Microsoft has more incentive than, than what's been concluded so far. So Sony outlines all these apparent errors, how the CMA did not consider or model the benefits of Game Pass or Microsoft's proposed licensing agreement to Sony. Uh, and sure enough, they also they also pointed out, uh, pointed out that recent story about Redfall and how the PS5 version was canceled. And they even get into the semantics of how gamers today are very perceptive to different console versions, citing channels like Digital Foundry and how people are, are highly engaged in conversation about, you know, even minor differences in console versions. And we also hear that during the Remedies hearing, the SI CEO Jim Ryan said if PlayStation got degraded versions of Call of Duty, it would, quote, seriously damage our reputation, our gamers would desert our platform in droves, and network effects would exasperate the problem, our business would never recover. Now he is really laying it on thick with that one, which again, this was said during the remedies hearing. So this was not written for this document. We're just hearing about it now, but either way, we're probably losing some context on more arguments that were made during that hearing, uh, which led to this, you know, very broad, but obvious, you know, he's trying to paint it as a worst case scenario of this is what's going to happen to our business. And that's a big problem. And they don't want the deal to go through. And we, we already know all that stuff. Um, so even though he's laying it on thick, there's some, you know, again, there's more kind of weird arguments being made in this document. Um, but they have to make every possible case they can because this is not good news for them. I mean, that's the one thing we can always say, right, is that since day one, when this acquisition was announced, you know, and I said it in the video where this happened, you know, this is categorically bad news for PlayStation. But the question is, how bad, right? And we just don't have that answer. That's why this entire process has been the way that it's been. But, you know, big surprise that Sony's addendum has uh, all this stuff being brought up. So they're, you know, still doing what they can, but the writing has been on the wall for a while now. And since we are seeing the CMA lighten up on the console area, we had the European Commission report about how they're likely to pass it now. Um, they can easily fight this in the US. So they're they're getting, they're seeing the green lights that they need so far. So it's, you know, probably going to happen, but we'll talk more about the next update when we get it. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus. The weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. You can follow the link down below. Supporting this channel, a number of ways can gain you an entry and I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. 
Those are all the stories that I wanted to talk about with you all from this past week. And our Tuesday video was looking at PS Home's second beta. And that sounds weird to say, almost like it's 2007 all over again. But uh, no, Destination Home, the restoration project, just launched their second closed beta. Really, it's open because you can join their Discord and you can just hop right in as long as you get a, a PS3 with some hybrid uh, hybrid firmware to install their uh, home package, or you can use our PCS3. But I recently checked into the new spaces, cosmetics. So if you want to just live vicariously, you can also go check that out. And as always, uh, another upload on Tuesday. But until then, that is it. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Benecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I will see you all next Friday.